Hello everyone and thank you for very much for joining us today. Today we'll be taking a look at mobile market research. So what are we going to cover? We're going to start by looking at what it actually is and why there's so much interest in mobile market research. We'll have a whistled stop tour through some of the history just to enhance your understanding of where we've been and, and where we might be heading. We'll also have a look at the international context uh, for people who are thinking of perhaps conducting mobile market research um, in different countries, there are some things to be on the lookout for to make sure you don't fall into some of the potential traps out there. We'll also have a look at some of the applications of mobile market research for both quantitative and qualitative research. And of course, we'll have a look at what some of the challenges are. Um, and of course, um, having a brief look at some of the ethical, regulatory and privacy issues that we need to think about. And we'll finish off today by having a look at what the future may hold and perhaps providing um, a bit of advice of you know, what you might be thinking about and perhaps how can, you can help advance the state of what the industry knows about mobile market research. So what is mobile market research? It's many things. It's quantitative research where the participants complete surveys on their mobile devices. It's mixed mode quantitative studies where some participants are completing surveys on a PC and others are using a mobile device. It's also quantitative research where participants allow apps or applications on their mobile device to gather information about them and their environment without them being actively involved. Um, this is often referred to as passive data collection. There is, of course, a great deal of mobile qualitative research. Um, and in these sort of studies, the mobile device either facilitates communication, so perhaps taking part in an online focus group from a tablet, or it may help facilitate actual data collection, so participants might be taking photos and recordings or quite often it involves using a combination of those two approaches. Mobile market research is also used in research communities and in these cases the mobile device is often a key method of communication or participation. And mobile market research is also used in face-to-face -face research um, where people use mobile devices to collect data and this is sometimes referred to as MCAPI or think of that as mobile computer assisted personal interviewing. And of course there's MCAPI where we're conducting computer assisted telephone interviews using mobile telephones or other mobile devices but more typically a mobile telephone. So why is there so much interest in mobile? Well there are a number of key drivers of this and the first one I'd like to talk about is the ubiquity of mobile devices. Data about the penetration of mobile phones, smartphones and tablets is changing all the time. So we need to be careful when we're talking about you know, facts and figures. But just to emphasize the scale of the mobile phenomenon, I'd like you to consider for a moment some of the data that came from the ITU's Measuring the Information Society report um, towards the end of 2013. And just some figures to give you a, a sense of the scale of mobile. Um, this report estimated that by the end of 2013, there would be about 6.8 billion mobile devices. And to put that figure in context, the global population is about 7.2 billion. Now, quick word of warning, 6.8 billion devices does not mean that 6.8 billion people have a mobile device because as many of you will appreciate, there are certainly plenty of people out there who have more than one mobile device. Um, some other interesting figures to note are, by the end of 2012, over 50% of the world's population lived in an area where the coverage was 3G or better. And by the end of 2013, there were almost 2 billion mobile broadband subscriptions. And Ericsson have forecasted that by the end of 2018, that figure will be looking at something like 6.5 billion. So what that really means is the world is quickly moving to a point where 
every economically active adult who wants a mobile phone will have one. And the trend is very much towards devices with internet access. And this is really increasing the potential for mobile research. The interest in mobile has also been driven by the interest in in the moment research. Um, there's a fairly widespread belief in marketing and market research that interviews conducted in the moment. So when somebody's making a purchase, when they're finishing a meal, when they're checking out of a hotel, when they've got off the plane, that those sort of encounters right at the moment of truth will give up, will reveal much more than a survey that we can conduct at a later date. I mean, traditionally in research, we've relied on participants recalling interactions you know, days, weeks, or even months after they may have you know, had an involvement with a product or a service or a brand. Um, in the moment approaches, uh, capture information while it's still very fresh in people's minds. Um, research that comes from the Pew Research Center estimated that about 44% of Americans slept with their phones next to them. Now, this sort of always available characteristic, uh, we can refer to that as, means that um, these devices are allowing researchers to conduct studies um, really close to that moment of truth, closer to when the product's being consumed, when the service is being experienced. And that's very attractive for marketers and market researchers. Um, smartphones have really driven a lot of interest in mobile research. Um, the very early forms of mobile research relied on SMS, WAP or, or downloaded software. And um, those options, they were often technically limiting and they actually required a high degree of cooperation from the participant. If you contrast that to where we are now, we've got much larger touchscreens, smartphones, um, we've got tablets increasing in popularity. And this has really increased the range of research that we conduct using mobile devices. Um, add to this the growth of high speed internet connections, you know, 3G, 4G and Wi-Fi um, has allowed mobile devices to be used in a growing number of ways. And also added to this is um, procedures, processes for, you know, writing apps have been standardized. A lot of market research software that we use, use allows us to create apps quite simply. So that's really, really opened up the range of alternatives that are available to researchers. And another key driver of the interest in mobile research is passive data collection. Um, mobile devices, smartphones and tablets can collect a wide variety of information as the research participant is going about their normal everyday life. And in many cases, this is based on the participant downloading an app onto their device. So consider for an example, a location tracking app can use the phone's GPS receiver to record um, where the participant is. So we could be looking at someone's journey to and from work and have you know, a detailed and accurate record of where they've been. So passive data is very attractive to marketers and researchers because we can collect a large amount of detailed data about what people do without burdening them with research tasks and also without introducing you know, biases that come from asking participants to decide what to report or what to capture. And we've also got geolocation technologies. So using geolocation, we can identify where people are track their movements, and send them appropriate surveys wherever they are. Um, one note about passive data collection and geolocation, we are obviously talking about these approaches being used with the appropriate consents in place. So I'd now I'd like to walk you through a brief history of mobile market research because um, it's really only in the 1990s that the first serious attempts to use mobile phones for market research took place. Um, in the early days, this was very much research conducted via SMS. So um, the questionnaires tended to be very short and it was really only a small percentage of the total market research surveys that were conducted using this method. 
and um, some of the early uses tended to be for those in the moment surveys where SMS could be used um, in conjunction with short surveys. Um, SMS surveys are still in use today for quite specific research needs. So if we fast forward to 2000, we started to see phones becoming smarter. They had larger screens and they tended to have internet access. And researchers started to use mobile phones for longer and slightly more complex surveys. Um, still a very small percentage of all market research. Um, this did see the um, advent though of the browser versus downloaded software or the browser versus app debate which still continues to this day and that's really talking about whether you want surveys on mobile devices to be run through a browser or whether you want people downloading an app and completing a survey that way. If we move to 2005, um, Blackberry phones and PDAs were becoming more common. And this is when we started seeing reports of small percentages of participants completing online surveys that were intended for PCs on mobile devices. And these were called unintentional or accidental mobile market research because whilst they were mobile market research, the researcher hadn't actually intended them for for them to be completed that way and that you know potentially poses some issues or pose some issues at the time. Um, and we also started to see the um, birth of qualitative approaches, mobile phones being used for things like diaries and mobile ethnography. And also people were starting to use mobile devices to connect with things like blogs and bulletin boards, online discussions and communities. 2007 saw the arrival of the iPhone and that really was when mobile market research started moving into a much higher gear. Qualitative researchers started to embrace those extra features that were available on the iPhone and more and more online surveys so that PC based online surveys started to be completed on these devices of choice. And coupled with that, we started to see the arrival of the Android operating system and that really helped um, increase the numbers of smartphones that were you know, available and mobile really started to reach a critical mass. 2010 saw the release of the iPad, which was followed by the growth of pen in penetration of tablets and that it was including both the iOS or iPad type devices as well as Android devices. And what this really meant was the researchers started to have a larger canvas to work with. Um, mobile efforts weren't restricted to really quite small screens. Um, iPads were you know, starting to approach the size of you know, a smaller notebook computer. Um, however, the, in more developing markets, there was still a fo focus on feature phones. And we really started to see that interest in growth in passive data collection. Now, if you're thinking about conducting mobile market research in an international context, you really do need to be aware that there are different opportunities and different challenges in different countries. In more developed markets, the default today is very much smartphones and tablets and people tend to assume that there will be reliable internet. In less developed markets, it is a different picture. The default there tends to be a feature phone and the assumption tends to be that internet access may not be readily available and it certainly may not be continuous. So in less developed markets, we do still see SMS studies and USSD being used. So it's also important to keep in mind that the definitions of developed and less developed countries don't always fit neatly together. Sometimes we have technologically advanced countries that have weak market research 
infrastructures, and also the converse can be true. So the key takeaway here is if you're planning an international project, make sure you get an up-to-date assessment of what the situation is there with respect to you know, phone technology. So mobile quantitative research, um, that tends to encompass two broad areas, survey research and other sorts of quantitative research. And I'd really just like to go through here some of the mobile quant survey techniques that are important. So these tend to be the unintentional mobile that we've talked about. We also have mobile only studies, mobile CAPI studies, mixed mode studies and MCATI studies. So unintentional mobile. Most market researchers who conduct online surveys are already using mobile market research, even if they've decided not to and even if they are not aware of it. Any online survey, even if it's not been designed for a mobile de device, is certainly likely to be completed on a mobile device by some participants, unless you've taken some specific measures to avoid this happening. As I mentioned earlier, this form of mobile market research has been referred to as unintentional mobile or accidental mobile research. And it's really the prevalence of unintentional mobile research um, that was one of the reasons by, why by 2014 it was safe to say that mobile market research had arrived. It's difficult to get reliable or consistent figures about what percentage of online surveys are accidental mobile, but there seems to be a consensus that around 20 to 30 percent of online surveys are completed by mobile devices. So if you're conducting online quantitative surveys, you really do need to think about what your approach is. Are you facilitating people to complete these surveys via mobile device? How are you doing these things? How are you testing them? And if you're perhaps deciding to prevent mobile devices for doing this, you know, what's your rationale for doing that? What is the implications for your sampling and your study results? So something to think really carefully about if you're doing online quad surveys. Mobile only surveys are ones where there's an expectation that all of the participants are going to complete that survey on a mobile device. Now, it is a fairly broad category, and in that we'd include surveys that are conducted via the internet using a browser on a mobile device, surveys that are conducted via a software app that's been downloaded onto a device, and also surveys that are conducted using SMS or another sort of mobile device protocol. When you're de designing mobile surveys, you really do need to understand the implications of using different screen formats and different versions of questions. MCAPI. Um, this is sort of a new acronym which refers to the mobile version of a computer-assisted personal interview. And it's really a new approach to a 30-year-old method. Um, until relatively recently, um, CAPI interviews were conducted using computers. We're now seeing the use of mobile devices. And one of the benefits that a mobile device brings to CAPI is the ability to configure the device to send the results back to a server. And there's also the opportunity to pull in some of those features of the mobile device and perhaps integrate multimedia, have people playing videos or audios, or perhaps recording interviews, taking photos, and using the mobile device to bring some extra materials in. Uh, mobile research also um, uses mixed mode studies. And by that, simply we mean studies where we're using more than one mode of data collection. A really simple example of that can be an online survey where some participants are completing the survey using a PC, whereas others are using a tablet or a mobile device to complete that survey. There's also an alternative way of something being mixed mode, 
and it might mean that an individual participant can complete that survey using multiple channels. So somebody might start an online survey on their mobile phone, complete a certain portion of those questions when they're out and about shopping, and then they may come home and complete another part of the survey on a PC. And sometimes you might be designing um, that to take advantage of the different channels. So things that are best done on a mobile device might be done on a mobile device, and things that are best done on a PC might be done on a PC. Or you might just be taking into consideration that people might like to complete surveys on different devices at times that are convenient to them. The current trend um, in survey research is what we would call platform agnostic. So we're not forcing people to complete surveys on the platforms that we choose, we're providing them with a range of ways that they can take part in surveys and pick the device that suits them best. Uh, two issues that you need to think about when conducting mixed mode um, studies is that you need to make sure that your surveys will work across multiple platforms and you certainly need to test whether um, your survey will work across a wide variety of platforms. And then when you get to the analysis, you do need to think about how you're combining the data. You know, if some people have completed the survey on a mobile device and some people have completed it on a PC, you know, what are the implications of adding those data sets together? So MCAPI, which is um, a computer-assisted telephone interview completed on a mobile device, um, this does represent a large proportion of the current mobile market research market. But in terms of why you might be interested in Mobile Caddy is it's actually from some of the Mobile Caddy studies that we're getting some really good feedback on the different sorts of sample profiles that come from you know, different sample frames. So what are the differences between people who complete a survey on a mobile device and people who complete a survey, say, in a landline Caddy interview? And we're also getting some good research on research about how do you combine different samples. So although these um, studies have been conducted looking at caddy interviews, there will be lessons that are learnt there that will enable us to take a look at how we combine samples across, you know, from online surveys, tablets and mobile, other mobile, smaller mobile devices, mobile phones. So that's an area, even if you're not working in the caddy area, you might keep an eye on some of the developments there because there will be some good learnings coming out of that. So mobile qualitative. When we're talking about mobile qualitative, we can be talking about purely mobile only qualitative exercises and we can also be talking about mixed mode studies where some people are using a mobile device and others are using some other options. Um, in the mobile qualitative space, the collection of personal and ethnographic information has been you know, a really strong use of those. Um, mobile devices are used to you know, collect information from participants. They might be taking photos, videos and sending those back. And sometimes the tasks are really quite simple, so taking a photo and sending it back by MMS, or there can be some really quite complex tasks completed on mobile devices. Mobile call has been an area where there's been, you know, like a lot of really fascinating and interesting um, conference papers in recent years. So if this is an area that interests you, you certainly will be able to go out there and you know, see what other people are doing and get some great sources of inspiration of how you might be able to bring the mobile platform into your qualitative research. So in terms of mobile research in action, what mobile research is currently doing is it's broadening the range of people who can be contacted. It's increasing the ability of research to get closer to the customer you know, in what we might call that moment of truth. And it's also enabling us to improve the quality of data. And it's doing this in a number of ways. You'll see some more examples of this later. But in the case of passive data, we can get really accurate pictures of where people have been. Whereas if we're asking people to recall things, they'd make mistakes, they'd not remember. Whereas passive data can really give us quite accurate data. 
Um, photographic evidence is also really helping us improve the quality of data. You know, people don't always remember things, but if they take a photo of it, we get an accurate picture of you know, like what was going on at the time. And simply by broadening the range of people who can be contacted, that can improve the quality of data if we can get better samples, rich people who may not be able to be included in research otherwise. So what are some of the current uses of mobile research? Well, we're seeing great examples of it coming out of the retail and customer experience space. We're seeing some great um, studies in terms of satisfaction, ad testing, ad tracking, and product testing. And there will continue to be some you know, really strong advances in you know, the area of advanced quant studies and also some uses in B2B research. So I would just like to walk through some case studies where we're going to have a look at how mobile is being used in studies and you know, what are the outputs and things. So understanding shopping trips and processes has been a major challenge for market research for many years. And mobile research is providing new solutions to many of these more difficult problems and producing answers that are a combination of the big three. They're better, they're faster, and they're cheaper. So what are the sorts of studies that people are doing? Um, shopper diaries where shoppers can use a mobile device to keep a diary of their shopping trips. And these diary tasks can include things like taking photos and videos, describing their shopping intentions. Shopping diaries are typically conducted as qualitative projects and you can add some extra information to the data collection. You know, people can take photos, they can scan their bills or receipts so you can have, you know, some actual factual information, things you might use to triangulate um, with what people have actually done while they've been shopping. Mobile phones have certainly had a place in shopping audits and we are starting to see them being used in you know, what we've termed quantified shopping. Quantified shopping is similar to the mobile shopping diary except it's much more quantitative in its focus whereas a diary tends to be more qualitative. Geolocation and geofencing are one of the newer fields in retail research. And what this is using, doing is using the mobile device to track a shopper's location and record what they do. It can also be used to trigger surveys as they approach a specific spot or leave a specific spot. And um, you can also use GPS technologies to really hone in on exactly where people are. There are some newer developments um, occurring in this field too where people are looking at lighting, utilising short range location techniques to try and track shoppers around shopping malls and stores. And wearables. Wearables is a very new area and we're really only just starting to explore what's possible there. But think of people using wearable cameras, eye tracking goggles, things like Google Glass to provide a more complete shopper eye view of the retail process. So this could be a contemporary replacement for things like accompanied shopping. And while these techniques are very much in their exploratory st stage, um, there's certainly so many benefits that could come from them that we will see people looking at these. This is a nice case study of how you can use location analytics and install mobile surveys. Locately are a US based shopper insight firm and they specialise in location analytics and location targeted mobile surveys. And they conducted a study with shoppers in the summer of 2013 in the US and this was time to coincide with the 4th of July celebrations. Um, Locately have a smartphone app and people opt into this app. The research triggered in-store interviews when Locately's location analytics technology detected that a shopper was in a store that people were interested in. And in this particular study, the stores they were interested in included a range of match mer mass merchandisers, grocery retailers and warehouse club stores. 
and what the location analytics captured was data on the shopper journey and this was passive data and it also gathered information about what happened inside the store so that's via a mobile survey. So the data and insight generated by the research operated at two levels. There was a macro level and a micro level. At the macro level, the data was able to answer questions around the awareness and the impact of in-store shopping promotions, dollars spent to prepare for the 4th of July events, and also location-specific metrics, such as the stores visited, stores that people drove past, and the time they spent in stores and the distance travelled to get there. At a micro level, the data um, allowed them to track a single participant's journey. This journey could be illustrated on a map, and it also could be annotated with survey feedback from the stores they visited. So this study showed the power of integrating location analytics and behavioural data. In an online survey, researchers at MMR were surprised by the number of cereal packages respondents to claim to have stored at home. And the number was much lower than they expected. So to check the accuracy of the data, they asked approximately 150 participants to take a photo of the place where they stored their cereal and to send the picture via MMS to the agency. And this showed that on average, people had almost twice as many packs of cereal than they had claimed to have based on recall. And it also showed that the proportion of own label was much higher than people had claimed. So this is a simple and great example of using mobile to enhance data quality. Another area that people are very interested in at the moment is location triggered surveys. Um, I'm sure some of you will have heard of the Mappiness project that's being run in the UK. It's had quite a bit of media attention and there's certainly quite a bit of published data on it. So if you're interested in it, you can certainly dig up more detailed information. But what the Mappiness project was wanting to find out was what factors affected how happy people are in the UK. The project was based on an app that was signalled twice a day and asked people to rate how happy they were. And then this data was then combined with the phone coordinates using GPS. The project was launched in the UK in 2010 and the initial report was based on over a million responses gathered from almost 22,000 participants. So in addition to the happiness rating that participants gave, the GPS data allowed the team to determine what the weather was like, whether it was daytime or not, and what area that people were in. And the app also asked who they were with and what they were doing. Now the general findings of this study are not a surprise. Um, they've learnt things like being out of urban areas is associated with being more happy and being by the seaside is the best place of all to be. The published paper is a useful res resource in terms of methodology and I think just the idea of how they're combining, you know, like a survey response and G accurate GPS information, so to give you some inspiration for how you might be able to use location triggered surveys. There's another great case study that comes from Marketing Sciences and Tesco, and it has a look at how MCAPI has been incorporated into retail research. Tesco, as many of you will know, is a large retailer and they were looking to you know, enhance their customer research. They had previously used a mystery shopping program, but it was felt that um, the focus shouldn't be on specific standards, but should be on customers. And they thought the best way to get customer feedback about shopping was face-to-face -face at the stores. So um, UK agency Marketing Sciences were commissioned to deliver a really enormous project they needed to conduct 100 interviews per store at over 950 Tesco stores a week. And this included a number of rural and hard to reach locations. And the reporting timeline was quite tight. Store level reports needed to be delivered two weeks after the field work. So the solution was to use tablets that were loaded with research apps for confirmant. 
and the tablet they used um, needed to meet certain criteria in terms of having you know good battery life, being light enough for interviewers to hold, being cost effective with the right screen size and colours. The devices also needed to be not too attractive to potential thieves. They needed to be able to run offline when there was no internet and they needed to be able to handle questionnaire updates and live messaging. And so the reporting was facilitated via dashboards that were able to provide information at local, regional and national level and um, to give a common language between store managers and people further up the chain of command. So by the end of November 2013, this particular project had collected over 1.5 million interviews. Um, it was estimated they'd saved 581 trees by not using 24 tonnes of paper. For the agency's client, it meant getting very close to the customers at every store with rapid delivery of meaningful results. And for the agency, it meant they could deliver one of the UK. So again, an, a large project, but some really practical benefits from bringing mobile devices into that study. So what are some of the challenges that we face with mobile surveys? Um, up until now, we've been talking really about, you know, like what are the benefits, but you know, there are still some challenges that we need to work through and um, explore further. So survey length and shorter surveys is often talked about in relation to mobile research. Um, there's also um, the issue that PC-based online surveys are very cost efficient. Mobile devices still themselves have limitations and the devices have a fairly high degree of variability. We still need to address challenges of achieving participant cooperation and we've also got to keep an eye on the ethical, regulatory and privacy concerns. So the challenge of the length of mobile surveys. This has really been driven by a fairly widespread belief that surveys on mobile devices need to be shorter. Now, we actually are starting to get some data that suggests that this actually may not be the case. Um, there's certainly been some research on research conducted that would tend to suggest that perhaps it's not a big an issue as we may have intuitively thought it would be. But as an industry, we do need to explore some strategies for dealing with survey length and mobile devices. Um, some people are looking at things that have been called chunking or modularizing. If we've got long surveys, can we break them into to smaller components so people can complete um, a longer survey in, say, three small chunks? Um, and then we need to do some ongoing research on research to look at you know, how those can be um, broken down, what are the impacts on data, and how can we bring that data back together again. Um, the cost efficiency of PC-based online surveys is one of the challenges that mobile research needs to address. Mobile surveys, are typic mobile surveys typically cost the same or more than PC-based online surveys. And mobile surveys tend to be a little bit more limited in terms of sample. So what this has meant is that Mobile's often been relegated to situations where it's felt to give better data. Now, by better data, we can mean a number of things. We can mean data that we think is better quality because it's collected in the moment. It can mean better data because we're able to reach you know, samples that we couldn't reach if they weren't on a mobile device, and a number of other things. But if and when the cost efficiency of and or the gap in cost efficiency between PC-based surveys and mobile surveys closes, that will actually probably see mobile research take off more. Device limitations. There are still some concerns with the um, limitations of various mobile devices. Um, most of these concerns actually though relate to phones and not tablets. Phone screen sizes are still small, and so des designing a full range of question types can be challenging.
we also have to consider when we're conducting mobile market research the variability of devices. Mobile phones are much, much more variable than PCs are. If you're conducting online PC-based research, you can be relatively comfortable that you're talking about people completing your surveys on a Windows machine or a Mac. You can also make some assumptions about screen size. You can assume that most people will be conducting the survey on a screen size that's 800 by 600 pixels or larger. And you tend to be able to assume that most people are coming into those surveys on a relatively modern browser. Phones, however, have more operating systems and more possible configurations. Some good news here is though, with the growth in Android and iOS as sort of the two dominant operating systems, there's starting to be a bit less variability. So while those two remain strong, there actually will be some um, ability to make some assumptions. When we're conducting market research, you know, we're always thinking about the ethical regulatory and privacy concerns. And as with other modes, some of these concerns you know, are general concerns and some of them are quite specific to the mode. Um, I don't want to really dwell on these too much now, but some of the things to start thinking about are the safety of people taking part. We really don't want people driving and filling in surveys. Um, we need to think about how we define and achieve informed consent, and obviously this will vary for different types of studies. You know, people downloading apps, people being involved in passive data collection will be different to people who are, you know, agreeing to take part in online surveys. And there's also some specific issues you need to think around, around qualitative, or when people are taking photos, what if they take a photo of somebody else who hasn't given consent? encourage you to you know read up on these and refer to you know like the relevant codes and guidelines from the industry associations we never want to annoy people when we're conducting market research and it is actually a little bit easier to do that with mobile phones you don't want to send people too many messages you need to be careful about what time of day you're contacting people this could be an issue in global studies and also with people travelling overseas, most people are travelling with their mobile now. If they happen to be in um, you know, Sydney for a weekend and you're calling them from London, you want to make sure that you're not ringing them in the middle of the night or sending them a text message in the middle of the night. Um, we need to think about avoiding participant costs. Uh, this can even be a little bit hard to judge in mobile studies. If somebody completes a um, online survey using their mobile device and you're using up you know an amount of their contracted bandwidth you know should you be trying to reimburse them for that if they use a lot of their bandwidth um, for the month completing your survey are you then causing them to pay extra charges or, or not be able to use their mobile at the end of the month so it can be a little bit tricky to even judge sometimes so certainly worth um, keeping an eye on and thinking about it in relation to your project um, and as always, we need to be thinking about how can we ensure privacy and anonymity. And if people are conducting surveys out and about, that can be a little bit harder if people are able to view what they're doing. And we also need to in ensure that um, all communications between mobile devices are as secure as they can be. So what's the future for mobile research? Um, we certainly believe it's arrived, but perhaps not yet an established method. I'd really like to leave you with four thoughts for a mobile future. Um, we will be hoping that we can get more sample options for conducting mobile research. Keep in mind the possibility and potential of wearables. It's still very much in its early phase, and even amongst the tech and geek crowd, there are people who think wearables are too ugly to wear or too impractical. But the sheer power of what they will be able to do in terms of passive data collection and things is so strong that people will really be exploring these. And um, you may want to make sure that you're on top of those developments. Integrating passive data and survey data could be a really powerful way to bring together accurate data 
and more detailed whys and specific understanding of you know somebody went somewhere but why did they go there and make sure you keep in mind being platform agnostic in your research let people choose how they would like to take part in your studies and make sure your studies will work well across a range of devices so if you'd like to learn more about market research, there are many, many ways that you can do that. And I'd just briefly like to um, segue into a customer service announcement. Um, there is a new 2014 version of the SMR book, Answers to Contemporary Market Research Questions. The 2014 version has three new chapters, one of which is about mobile market research. And that's certainly one of the shortest ways that you'll get a really good understanding of some of like the key topics around mobile research and um, if you need to sort of get up to speed quite quickly that's a nice way of doing that um, if you're interested in that book I'd encourage you to go to the SMR website and as an even more self-interested customer service announcement there's a forthcoming book called the handbook of mobile market research which um, I've co-written with two very knowledgeable mobile market researchers Ray Pointer and Naveen Williams um, that's being published by Wiley and being released um, at the beginning of September so if that's something you're interested in stay tuned and I'm sure you will hear about it and finally I'd just like to thank you for joining me today um, and I welcome any questions that you might have about mobile market research. Thank you.